Uh, yes, we have two great papers today, and each one is given a good ample amount of time, which is really nice. So I'll introduce our first uh, presenter, and then after the first presenter, we can take some questions. And then I'll introduce the second. We can have the second paper and take questions. And if there's time to talk about both papers together or to think about what's been discussed during the hour and a half, then we can make time for that as well. So our first speaker today is uh, Vivian Hamilton, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Humanities, Social Sciences and the Arts, as well as the Director of the Hicks and Riggs Forum for Responsive Science and Engineering at Harvey Mudd College. Um, she has co-edited a collection called Inevitably Toxic, Historical Perspectives on Contamination, Exposure and Expertise, which seems particularly relevant for what she's gonna talk about today. Uh, the title of her talk today is Scientific Assurance, Dental X-rays and the Patient Consumer. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Hamilton. Uh, so thank you so much for that introduction and for the chance to share my work today. I've spent quite a lot of time exploring the history of x-ray technology, but usually in a medical setting, looking at the development of radiology as a specialty uh, and the use of x-rays mostly in hospitals. So over the years, I've also gathered some material about dental x-rays, and honestly, I've mostly ignored it, uh, except for a sort of nagging sense that something really interesting and different was going on in, uh, with dental x-rays. So I'm really, um, I really appreciate this chance to pull that material together. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions since I'm still sort of working to frame these observations. So as uh, Rachel uh, already mentioned earlier this morning, by the 1920s, X-ray machines had become a standard feature of hospital medical care in the US, helping doctors to diagnose fractures and determine the location of foreign objects in the body. And along with radium, x-rays were also used as a therapeutic agent to treat skin conditions, cancers, and other tumors. While dentists began experimenting with x-rays right away in the uh, late 1890s, this technology took longer to become a standard feature of dental offices. And you can see that in advertisements to dentists in uh, dental journals in the 1920s, uh, hoping to persuade dentists to splurge on some x-ray equipment, in this case, as a Christmas present to themselves. And by the early 1930s, there was even more work to do to persuade dentists to purchase an x-ray unit or to upgrade their existing equipment when many practices had been hit hard by the depression. Equipment sold by the Ritter X-ray Company based out of New York cost about $1,000 at the time which was equivalent to about $20,000 today. And salespeople were told that the ability to size up and approach a dentist as a buyer is useful in determining how to open the interview, how to get under his skin, you might say. A Ritter training manual generated a list of 25 common objections that salespeople might hear from dentists unsure about buying their own x-ray machine with the aim of coaching their employees on how to react to these different anticipated objections. And so these objections included uh, dentists appealing to their bad finances, wanting to wait to have cash to pay for the equipment, wanting to get married first, preferring to send their x-ray work out. Uh, and as you can see from, num from number eight here, uh, dentists who might just say, I, I don't want an x-ray machine. So salespeople were told, over and over again to make promises about the positive impression that x-ray equipment would make on paying customers. Customers who would be newly attracted to the dentist's practice and willing to pay for x-rays and also pay for the necessary dental procedures revealed by the x-ray. Many companies in addition to Ritter adopted a similar advertising strategy, making promises about the positive effect that x-ray equipment would have on their patients. The British x-ray company, Watson & Sons, promised the installation of x-ray equipment cannot but have a salutary effect on the mental impression your patients have of your methods, offering a constant and effective advertisement, a silent creator of goodwill, <coughs> of confidence and goodwill, even when not in operation. In this paper, I take a closer look at sales literature pitched directly at dentists as well as training material for x-ray salespeople 
asking about the particular kind of patient reflected in this material. And what emerges is a set of expectations about patients as consumers, expectations that these patients would be educated enough to demand modern dental technique, but not enough to actually evaluate the skill of the dentist. X-ray technology was expected to function as a powerful symbol of modern scientific dentistry for these patients. And in the second part of the paper, I take a closer look at the actual design of X-ray technology, uh, asking how this imagined patient is reflected in the design of the X-ray equipment itself. And I argue there's a striking contrast between the way the patient was expected to see the dentist as an expert creator of X-ray images and the actual practice of dental radiography. <clears throat> dental X-ray equipment took many of the decisions out of the hands of the dentist, and they were assured that very little skill or knowledge was actually needed to operate the machines. So while the advertising expected active, discerning customers and skilled dentists, the actual machines expect passive and compliant patients and dentists who place their trust in the equipment rather than in their own judgment. <clears throat> the first important feature of the imagined dental patient in these x-ray ads is their agency to choose which dentist to visit. Dentists were told that the atmosphere and environment of their dental practice was crucial to attaining and attracting and retaining paying customers. So an, an ad for SS White operating equipment laments that unfortunately knowledge, skill, and experience are too often judged last by a patient. They estimate a man's ability first by his surroundings, then by his personality, and his skills and training last. Fair or unfair, this method of mass approval is nevertheless a fact. In the 1930s, professional dental care was still a luxury for many people, with a display of white healthy teeth representing a path to upward class mobility. X-ray companies promised dentists that their equipment would signal wealth and high social class and attract patients who were already wealthy or willing to pay to achieve this social uplift. Not so subtly, X-ray salespeople were coached to praise dentists on the little touch of refinement that they've um, you know, placed in their office, betting that their patients have noticed the change. They promise dentists that by the introduction of X-ray work your, into your practice, you'll find that you will unearth a higher class of work, which will enable you to eliminate undesirables from your practice. Without an X-ray, the better class in the community will avoid your office. Now, this better class is never explicitly described in these ads, but you're going to see from the images of model patients and dentists in my slides that there's a pervasive expectation of whiteness throughout these ads. And companies further aligned dentists with these anticipated patients, acknowledging dentists' own desire for financial security. In one short story uh, that Ritter sent out to dentists, a fictional Dr. Colby is able to finally buy Mrs. Colby a fur coat, thanks to the successful installation of a Ritter X-ray machine. In order to achieve the social uplift promised by dental care, the imagined patient wanted modern progressive dentistry. And many ads emphasize the power of their equipment to, to uh, create that impression. Your equipment speaks, what will you make it say about you? The environment into which you invite your patient subtly tells whether or not you are progressive and successful. Uh, GE, uh, tells dentists that frequent use of the x-ray is one of the ways by which the public is learning to distinguish the progressive dentist. And Ritter emphasizes a dentist is accepted by his patients as being as modern as his surroundings indicate. So x-ray equipment was of course not the only prop in the performance of modern scientific dentistry. Stein Grumson has analyzed ads for dental products in this period and found that by the 1920s, mentioning science became a regular feature in toothpaste ads with dentists shown wearing white coats, looking into microscopes or lighting Bunsen burners, signifying their alignment with scientific dentistry. Dentists were told to expect that the public regarded dentistry as an exacting science. 
um, and, and that the public would expect these visual displays of scientific equipment and dress. So again, the x-ray machine, even when it's not turned on, operates as part of this scientific backdrop. But just as the imagined patient was expected to demand scientific dentistry, these patients were also expected to actually know very little about the scientific principles of dentistry. And so the x-ray images themselves, even more than the equipment, um, become really important in testifying to the skill of the dentist. Dentists were told that patients would appreciate the accuracy of an x-ray diagnosis as with their own eyes, they can see the conditions that need treatment. And it's only natural then that they would have greater confidence in the dentist. Confidence in a dentist who might, for instance, be recommending a course of treatment based on the shadows visible in an x-ray, something visible and tangible that the dentist could point to for a skeptical or reluctant patient. I wanna pause here though to emphasize an important tension in the way these x-ray images are functioning, both as seemingly objective and easy proof of the state of tooth anatomy but also reassurance of the dentist's skill and expertise. So in the quote, we can see that patients are expected to be able to see with their own eyes what's going on in the image. But in this picture, uh, we see the dentist pointing to and explaining the x-ray to the patient. So the expert interpretation of the image is key. And this same relationship of the viewer to the x-ray image holds in many other spheres in this period. Uh, for instance, Initially, x-rays were brought into court cases as evidence to support eyewitness testimony with the expectation that the x-ray simply revealed evidence about the body and uh, it would be straightforward for a jury to be able to interpret these images just as though they're photographs. Um, increasingly, however, expert witnesses were brought in to attest to the process of making the image, uh, which is crucial, and also to interpret the image for members of the jury. And similarly, uh, in, a, in the medical sphere, uh, a very early practice of allowing patients to walk away with their own medical x-rays faded fairly quickly in the early 20th century. The first radiologists insisted on their own interpretive expertise and really wanted to distinguish their practice from the commercial and recreational use of x-rays that was available to many members of the public who were you know, going to department stores and fairs to get their hands and feet x-rayed. So again, to, to recap, what we see in these x-ray ads is an image of a patient who is expected to be discerning and demanding, able to choose a dentist based on the impression of modernity, prosperity, science, and skill that is projected by both the x-ray equipment and the x-ray images themselves. But at the same time, this was a patient not expected to be able to fully evaluate the skill of the dentist and who is reliant on the expertise of the dentist to help make sense of x-ray evidence. And so in this, in this next section, I wanna consider how this imagined patient is actually reflected in the design of the x-ray equipment. So while the patient <laughs> expected skill and expertise, um, the design of the equipment promised to take most decisions out of the hands of the dentist. And here Ritter, is promising that because of all the fixed and stable factors of operating their machines, the resulting X-ray images are never too light or too dark, but always the proper density. One of the really prominent features of a number of dental X-ray machines, um, and this is, I, I'm calling this out because this is not a feature of hospital X-ray machines in this period, um, was the automatic timer which Ritter promised would eliminate all guesswork for dentists. So dentists could just rotate the dial on the timer to the desired length of exposure and the machine would turn off automatically when the time was up. And here we're looking at a close-up of a Victor X-ray automatic timer. And you can see on the back, there's a very handy chart that dentists could use for reference. So they could look up the time of exposure based on the area of the mouth that they were X-raying uh, so you can see lines for molars, upper cuspids, bicuspids, and then also the age of their patient. They could choose young patient, adult under 50, adult over 50, and then also the type of x-ray film they were using, whether it was regular or rapid film. 
And then also, and so, you know, using those variables, they could find the appropriate time of exposure. And then on the last column, they could also find the recommended angle for the head of the um, X-ray tube. And here on um, an actual machine, we can see this dial that shows the angle with another helpful quick reference um, telling you which angle to use for different parts of the mouth. Uh, and here's another similar chart, this time on the side of a Ritter timer. And Ritter promises that there's no need to hire a specially trained graduate or any kind of specialist to operate their machine. There are no mysterious or cumbersome adjustments. Everything is charted. All that is necessary is to follow a simple routine of exposure. And dentists, you know, they didn't even need to memorize these exposure times and angles since these charts are printed on the machine in multiple places. So while, uh, while these companies promised again that patients were gonna experience getting an X-ray as proof of the dentist's expertise, the design of the technology required very little judgment. I think there's a similar kind of disconnect between the agency of the imagined and discerning patient as consumer and the passivity and trust expected of that patient once they sat down to be X-rayed. Ads and manuals for these dental machines are full of these kinds of images of patients patiently sitting motionless for their x-rays, holding their head in just the right way. While Ritter boasted of all the factors of operation of the machine that they had standardized, timing, voltage, angles, they don't ever mention the need to discipline the patient to maintain a particular kind of posture. The compliance of the patient is simply expected. And the extent of this necessary trust on the part of the patient is highlighted even more when we consider issues of safety. Any room with an X-ray with X-ray equipment was a potentially hazardous space. Patients and doctor and dentists uh, could receive an electric shock. They could be hit by falling or unstable equipment. And of course, as soon as the X-ray machine was turned on, invisible radiation posed a danger. X-rays emanated from the tube, and if they hit certain other kinds of surfaces, they created secondary X-rays, uh, which would then scatter in multiple directions. The effects of radiation exposure were usually not noticed immediately. Burns, hair loss, skin, and blood changes could take weeks or sometimes even years to develop. By the early 1930s, these dangers were well known to doctors and to the wider public. The National Bureau of Standards published the first nationally recognized set of X-ray safety guidelines in 1931. And I've examined the production of these guidelines in greater detail in other work. Here, I just wanna point out how the existence of these seemingly sure quantitative guidelines masked deep uncertainties about the actual effect of radiation on the body. At the center of the guidelines um, are a set of tables that uh, show the minimum lead thickness that's needed to protect against X-rays produced at certain voltages. But what's not apparent um, from these quantitative guidelines is that the numbers are really just based on a kind of best guess that was developed based on observations of a number of X-ray rooms in British hospitals in the 1920s. So this was very anecdotal and kind of observational um, so a number of uh, physicists actually went around and observed the, uh, the intensity of x-rays leaving tubes in x-ray rooms where the workers seemed healthy. And from that, those initial observations in the 20s were built these, these complex tables of um, guidelines for these lead thicknesses. Some of the uncertainty is evident in a second layer of guidelines um, in, this, in this handbook which recommends that all x-ray workers have their blood monitored um, every few months and also to wear a badge of x-ray film for 14 working days every four months to detect any stray radiation which might be present, present in an x-ray space. So again, I just wanna highlight that the, 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 all the uncertainty that was still present um, in this period. And while presumably these recommendations should apply to dental offices, I haven't found any reference to them in the advertising material aimed at dentists. 
instead, dentists were just sort of got this blanket assurance uh, from Ritter that there's absolutely no danger in the use of a Ritter shockproof x-ray unit. And even in the name, you can see attention to electrical rather than radiological safety. Dentists are assured that the tube is enclosed in a lead cylinder of 1 16th inch thickness, though without knowing the voltage of the tube and without having this handy uh, National Bureau of Standards chart in front of you, there's no way to know if that thickness is actually sufficient based on those standards. And even more, I haven't seen any advice for dentists about calming any fears their patients might have about the x-ray dangers. And in fact, the safety of the patient seems all but disregarded. Dentists are assured of their own safety since actual exposures are really confined to the patient only and the patient becomes the absorbing medium. So at, by this time, doctors had developed multiple kinds of practices for measuring a dose of x-rays but so far I haven't seen any attention to x-ray measurements in dental practice. Dentists are simply being asked to trust that these manufacturers um, have a machine that's offering a safe dose to patients and that all these safety precautions, <coughs> excuse me, are adequate. So overall, what I find is there seem to be two different patients, the kind of dichotomy that we've already been talking about this morning. There's an active discerning and even demanding patient as consumer who's gonna choose a dentist based on an impression of skill and expertise. And then there's this passive trusting patient who submits to quietly to x-ray examination without any concern for safety. And there are also two different dentists. There's the one who is perceived by the patient to be performing difficult scientific dentistry and the one expected by the x-ray manufacturers to abdicate most of that responsibility and judgment to the equipment itself. So patients are expected to place their trust in the dentist and dentists are expected to place their trust in the machine. This is a very different situation from the one I found in hospital medicine in this period where doctors resisted standardized methods of both x-ray diagnosis and treatment, emphasizing the necessity of their own clinical art and judgment due to both idiosyncratic patients and also unique uh, equipment that they sort of had to get to know themselves. And as I shared briefly, x-ray safety in hospitals really remain the responsibility of doctors who monitored lead shielding for cracks, who checked the blood counts of their technicians. And I did look back at the conversations leading up to these um, N NBS guidelines, and I don't see any attempt to engage dentists in the development of these guidelines and protocols. So coming back then to the initial questions that I posed about the expected patient and the design of this technology, I found again that x-ray equipment emphasized easy and routine use for patients, for, for dentists, that it expected really pretty compliant patients. Yet x-ray equipment was also expected to be this crucial prop in the performance of scientific dentistry. And this is not to downplay the actual benefit of the kinds of diagnoses made possible by with x-rays. Uh, dentists, from what I can tell so far, were delighted to be able to see cavities forming many months before they were actually visible in a visual exam. But I do think that at a time when advertising directly to patients was professionally taboo for dentists, we need to consider the important advertising work done by the equipment itself. And also the, this, the disjunction between what these machines promised and the actual experience of operating one. All right, I'll end there, thank you. Thank you, that was excellent. Uh, I have lots of things to say. Let's see if, uh, I don't think anybody's chatted yet. If anybody wants to raise their hands or uh, has a question, you can, Ah, great. Fabiola, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so uh, it's actually amazing. That's a fascinating paper, I actually loved it. Um, it's actually amazing seeing the overlaps in the material culture of like some beds and actually x-ray machines. Um, but my question is more about um, actual dentists. So you mentioned the kind of like difficulties and issues that was eventually resulted. Um, but 
in my own research, when some beds were introduced, there were dermatologists were seen as the experts and there was for and against. And because it was such a new technology, those that are for kind of outweighed those that, that were against because of the time of research and resources to actually look at what was happening in the long term. Um, but were there any sort of activist groups within the medical faction? So any dentists which did campaign against the use of them and did they eventually get like a stronger voice, you know, a decade or two decades later? Yeah, that's a really great question. Thank you. I have to admit that the part of my research where I want to look more closely at the kind of conversation happening within um, you know, dental journals and things like that, that is still ongoing. So I do, you know, I've, uh, all I can say is that in the 1920s, which is sort of where I've started looking at the literature, um, there's definitely still, I, I wouldn't say active resistance is what I'm finding, but just skepticism that this is necessary. So there's a lot of work that dentists who are proponents need to do to explain the benefit. And I think what's interesting from that material that I've looked at is that there's a lot more attention to explaining all of the sort of tacit and unspoken practices that are necessary to actually create a, a clear x-ray image. So the kind of promise that we're getting from the manufacturers that everything's very simple and straightforward doesn't really align with the actual practice of taking an x-ray and um, again, right now, that material for me, though, is in the 20s, and I, I do need to be very careful to pay attention to changes in the x-ray equipment. So it's possible that Ritter um, has created an x-ray machine that is much easier to use than the machines from a decade before. But again, I guess I, guess I would just say not so much active resistance as sort of maybe reluctance to learn a new technique and or, um, you know, sort of... Uh, attention to all of the true difficulties in learning how to do this to get an x-ray that's actually um, useful, you know, for dentists. Thank you. Yeah. Richard has a comment. Hi, right, thank you, Vivian. That was great. I really appreciated that. I'm gonna have more of a broader comment. I was thinking you know, as you were talking that you were you know, really a part of a, a, an important shift within history of medicine, which is talking about um, healthcare providers, ways of knowing beyond, you know, white male physicians, right? So talking about dentists, uh, nurses, dietitians, and, you know, sort of different ways of, of knowing um, beyond that traditional narrative. And, um, you know, the history of dentistry is, is something that historians of medicine have largely ignored. And I began thinking about this myself when I was uh, finishing an essay or writing an essay on the death of Diamante Driver who was you know, the 12-year-old black boy in Prince George's County, Maryland, who died from um, abscesses on his teeth that spread to his brain and, and caused a tumor. And so I began to, to think about these questions of dentistry and how, of course, dentistry evolved over time um, separately from medicine and um, you know, eventually evolved into a separate you know, pay structure. Um, and as Beatrix Hoffman talks about, you know, largely evolved outside of you know, the insurance industry that, that medicine was... Um, adhering to. And that structure of, of pay for dentistry is largely intact today. So I, I think that's an important part of your story as well. And, and also going back to, to Rachel's comments um, earlier, you know, the x-ray is a very important part of the civil rights movement as well, um, because it was such an important part of the Simps Simpkins v. Cone um, decision in which um, the lack of access to x-rays and the uh, the segregated hospital in Greensboro um, is part of what um, prompted um, that movement for Simpkins v. Cone, which desegregated hospitals um, across the South and eventually across the, uh, the country. So I, I think it's a, it's a rich conversation. I think you're hitting a, a number of different um, you know, avenues of important research. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's very helpful. And I you know, as you saw from the talk, I only just briefly started to explore that question of who has access to these x-rays or who is expected to be this, you know, active consumer. And um, it's something that I, I, anyway, I'd love to talk more just to hear some, uh, you know, uh, suggestions and strategies for discovering that part of the story, because there's not, I think it's not just an invisibility of um, patients of color, but at, from some of those quotes that I had up there, like an attempt to actively exclude patients of color from, from dental practices that have x-ray machines. So um, 
So trying to figure out though, what that geography looked like in terms of where these x-ray machines were showing up, what neighborhoods, which dentists had them. Um, yeah, thank you, it's, it's an important part of this. Elizabeth, do you have a comment? I do, it's, um, it's, a, it's much more pragmatic and not nearly as exciting as the last comment. But I, I, I'm a very pragmatic person and I deal with many things. And what I loved, and I have to say loved about the talk, was the fact that it's actually ongoing today in a very different way. So if you look at all the guidelines that we have, they're all produced by experts, all of whom are being paid by different companies or where they're doing research and all their own interest is actually in it. So they're sort of manipulated in a similar way, as opposed to guidelines being written by cold-blooded government epidemiologists who just take the facts and look at them as opposed to taking the ones that they approve of. Now, I do realize my opinion is probably more controversial than Laurie's was, but the truth is, is that no one is looking at it. No one is actually looking at the people. Like, and an example I could give you is there was actually the man who had actually, he was a very famous cardiologist, magnificent cardiologist, who actually had owned a patent on high sensitivity CRP. And in the Jupiter trial, in actual fact, having never looked at it, suddenly came out and said, everybody should be doing CRP on people to look at their cardiac risk. So even though there was huge outrage and a lot of people were very angry with it, the truth is, is this system is whereby your career depends on the guidelines following your success. And so like, I just think what you did is even though it was the 1920s and 30s, I think it just opens the door for valuation of what we say is good and what we say isn't good. And my interest is actually in it and I'm writing the guidelines. So thank you very much. It was really great. Thank you. I'm gonna get this name, Cabaret. I'm yeah. sorry if I said your name wrong. Oh, no sorry. problem. <laughs> I thought that was really interesting. And uh, uh, so, so I'm a physician and an epidemiologist and just a brief anecdote because of course the x-ray is part of dentists in Canada remunerated uh, through uh, private insurance uh, versus physicians. So there's, I know there's a pressure there, but I remember when I was uh, still more of my reproductive age and coming into uh, my dentist's office and uh, immediately being ushered to the, um, the x-ray machine. And so I, I just stopped the technician and said, do you want to maybe look in my mouth first? Because I don't know what evidence there is to go directly to an x-ray before you've done any form of evaluation. And, uh, so she panicked, uh, various other people were called and ultimately, I don't think they did the x-ray that time, but I was, I believe labeled as a difficult patient <laughs> because after that, <laughs> every time I came in, there was kind of a kerfuffle. Um, so, you know, uh, that was an, an informed patient coming in. And uh, there was, I think, I don't, I don't know that if they've done studies to see that it's, you know, more helpful to just screen widely with x-rays versus doing an exam first. And in medicine, we're, I mean, in medicine, we make all kinds of errors, but, but those kinds of studies are essential. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think, you know, it kind of highlights some gaps by the so-called experts. So this is excellent work. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple more minutes. Oh, okay. Antoine has a question. Yes, it's a follow-up question to some degree on uh, uh, Um which is uh, I also, you know, I also don't like being brought directly to the X-ray machine when I go to the doctor. I'm not an informed uh, patient. I am not a, I'm not a physician, but um, usually I, I, I resist it. And the one argument that my dentist always uses it, you know, it's paid for by your insurance. So, you know, why would you not do it? And, and I guess my rule of thumb is that I say yes, like every other time, but yeah. so completely an important strategy. But, but um, um, I, was, I was wondering, what is the, um, what is the state of, uh, sort of dental insurance at that time period? And then also, I mean, you talked a lot about how the, the x-ray machines were sold to the physicians. Once the physicians had the machine, was it a struggle to sell them to patients and did dentists charge patients and did then insurance pay for the x-rays or did patients have to pay out of their pocket? And so it was a challenge to get them to agree to, uh, to the x-rays or was it just enthusiasm and all patients, you know, they could afford it would, would, would ask for the, for the x-rays or. 
Yeah, thank you. That those are an excellent constellation of questions. So um, I still need, you know, to do some more work. To, I think to figure out exactly what the um, landscape of dental insurance looked like in this period. So if anyone else knows that better than I, I would love to hear. Actually, um, what I will say, I guess, just from the material I've looked at, is that there seems to be an expectation that the fee. So the the expectation is that as a dentist, you will charge a fee every time you do an X-ray, and that that fee will be reasonable. So there you know, um, Ritter, for instance, is promising their dentists that they will recoup the costs of, of um, buying a machine fairly quickly. So there doesn't seem to be any anticipation that whatever that fee is, um, is going to be so much more than what they're usually paying, um, you know, for, for a dental exam. So I think there's a sense, and I think you know, I, I really appreciate these comments, thinking about the, the modern circumstance in which these x-rays have become so routine they're screening without even any other kind of um, clinical indication that maybe, you know, I can do more to pull that out in my story to show this kind of the way they get sort of snuck in, you know, I think at a fairly low price point for the patient so that it just becomes another thing that's kind of rolled into the you know, the, the price you're already paying to see the dentist. So, um, so that's not a total answer, but thank you for the question because I think that's, um, yeah, I think that's that's important to to making sense of how this becomes so routine. Well, thank you. That was an excellent paper. I could see a general. I have so many thoughts too, but I will uh, maybe save them to the end after we hear the second paper. I want to make sure we have enough. 